Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Marilyn Latta and I'm a project manager with the State Coastal Conservancy. I'm excited to help lead our webinar today on Living Shorelines 101, where we'll define the term living shorelines and share some key considerations and case studies for living shorelines approaches on the Pacific Coast. The Coastal Conservancy has been leading some of the initial pilot projects that are testing the effectiveness of this design approach statewide. One of our biggest take home messages for today is that a wide diversity of shoreline habitats can be included in living shorelines design approaches as we hope to demonstrate with a small but diverse set of case studies. Here's our agenda for the webinar. I will start by giving an overview of the living shorelines design concept, including the need for this shoreline management and climate adaptation approach, the definition, information about projects conducted in the East and Gulf Coast, and special considerations for projects in California. Then my two colleagues, Evan Sloan and Joel Gerwine, will share case studies from different regions of California. Evan will share projects that include estuarine habitats in San Francisco Bay and coastal dunes at Cardiff Beach in Southern California. And Joel will share case studies that focus on open bay and tidal wetland habitats on the North Coast. Then I'll finish up with some policy and regulatory considerations and we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. As you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them into the questions chat box at the sidebar of your screen, and we will respond via chat if they are easy answers or address them during the, the QA section at the end. You are all muted as we have a lot of audience members. We are recording the webinar and we'll be sharing a PDF of our slides and the recording in a follow-up email at the end of the webinar. So we're going to start out with a couple of polls so you can all see the type of people participating in the webinar today. And our first question is, which sector do you work in? So you should see the poll on your screen. We'll leave that open for about 10 seconds. And now we'll close the poll. Great. It looks like we have a wonderful wonderful mix of city and county government, state, federal, nonprofit, and academics, and then private. That's great spread there. And our second question, do you feel like you know what living shorelines are? So we'll open the poll. Leave that open for a few minutes, seconds. And then we'll close that poll. Great. All right. We're already starting out with folks familiar with the concept. So California has lost natural shorelines of many types due to fill and development. Beaches, dunes, tidal wetlands, rocky shorelines, oyster and eelgrass beds, and other habitats have all been impacted by traditional hard engineering techniques for shoreline protection that involve dredging, fill, and placement of structures. This can include everything from highly engineered seawalls to groins and levees and coarse placement of concrete pieces and riprap. With climate change and sea level rise, the existing infrastructure of hard shoreline protection structures is necessary in some locations and will need to be maintained at bigger scales. There are also many opportunities to look at approaches such as managed retreat, shoreline restoration, and opportunities to design for diverse types of nature-based approaches for shoreline protection. It is possible to enhance biologically dynamic borders that increase species support and connectivity while also providing some level of physical buffering and protection. There's a growing interest in the US and around the world to use natural infrastructure to help coastal communities become more resilient to extreme events. There's a long history of shoreline, of hardening the shoreline for the purposes of flood control and development in the US and around the world. Placement of hard shoreline devices has been constructed in every coastal state. When coastal properties and infrastructure are located on a coastline that is experiencing erosion, we typically resort to hardening that shoreline. This can include any kind of artificial, permanent, or semi-permanent structure placed on the shoreline to prevent erosion. We've been hardening the shoreline for centuries, dating back to the Greeks and Romans. China and the Netherlands were also building coastal defense structures such as breakwaters as early as 175 BC. Shoreline hardening has increased dramatically in the last century with the explosion of human population and coastal development. In 2015, Rachel Gitman, then a postdoc at University of North Carolina, and her colleagues released the results of a meta-analysis they conducted that examined regional reports with shoreline hardening data from different areas around the United States. 
they concluded that 14% of the total shoreline is hardened, and if development continues at this pace, it may be more than 30% armored by the end of the century. This map shows areas in red that are already currently include more than 75% hardening, such as portions of Southern California. So what are the ecological consequences of shoreline hardening? Gitman and other researchers have documented environmental loss of this rich land water interface and impacts that this can cause on ecosystem functioning and species. This hardening has caused substantial impacts to habitat values and to species due to direct loss and various indirect impacts that can include wave deflection and erosion of other areas and severance of natural connectivity between habitat types. Hard infrastructure methods often are constructed at a high cost and require frequent maintenance in areas that have high wave energy. In 2012 alone, weather and climate events cost 110 billion in damages nationally. There are multiple published research papers that document the impacts of hardened shorelines on flora and fauna. Impacts include reduced species diversity, which affects food webs at the shoreline, and reduced physical space for habitat, nesting, breeding, and migration areas. The loss of ecosystem services has also been well documented, including to fisheries, public access, and other shoreline uses. Costanza and his colleagues have noted that coastal wetlands have been estimated to provide 23 billion per year in storm protection services alone, and much more work needs to be done to evaluate the full suite of ecosystem services and co-benefits from natural infrastructure. Living shorelines present an alternative to hardening, and they can include any shoreline management system that is designed to protect or restore natural shoreline ecosystems, through the use of natural elements, and if appropriate, man-made elements. This is accomplished through the strategic placement of plants, shell, stone, sand or mud fill, and other structural and organic materials. Restore America's estuaries and NOAA both have strong guidance documents and a history of supporting living shorelines approaches. NOAA notes in their 2015 guidance document that living shorelines is a broad term that encompasses a range of shoreline stabilization techniques along estuarine coasts, bays, sheltered coastlines, and tributaries. A living shoreline has a footprint that is made up mostly of native material. It incorporates vegetation or other living, natural, soft elements, alone or in combination with some type of harder shoreline structure, for example, oyster reefs, for added stability. Living shorelines maintain continuity of the natural land water interface and reduce erosion while pro providing habitat value and enhancing coastal resilience. The basic principles of this approach is that it is a restoration design strategy to achieve multiple biological and physical objectives, including reducing shoreline erosion while maintaining coastal processes. It's important to note that designs can't just include placement of rock sills that mimic hard breakwaters, but rather should be designed to protect and enhance habitat values for fish and wildlife. The approach has potential as a method to adapt to sea level rise, to buffer against storm surges and shoreline erosion that are estimated to increase as climate changes. In many cases, it's intrinsically compatible with existing regional habitat planning and restoration goals that focus on protection of natural processes and function. Living shorelines can include multiple approaches to natural infrastructure on the shoreline that can simultaneously achieve societal, environmental, and economic co-benefits. Co These can include creating fish and wildlife habitat, attenuating wave energy, accreting sediment, reducing erosion, and projects can provide outdoor recreation if that's planned into it. More experimental goals being explored are the potential for these habitats to sequester carbon and help to buffer against ocean acidification. The California State Ocean Protection Council and other partners are advancing steps to better assess the potential of eelgrass beds and other habitat types to provide these services. So there are many terms for what is ultimately using nature to achieve both biological and physical goals on the shoreline and adapt to climate changes. Some states and project efforts have gotten very bogged down by trying to come to agreement on terms. The approach has been described with various terminology, including soft shorelines, green infrastructure, nature-based adaptation, and other terms. A key point is that this particular technique is for shoreline habitats in estuarine and marine environments versus other climate adaptation approaches in other habitat types. 
In addition to the many habitats that can be included in a Living Shorelines project, there is also a gradient of green and gray features that can be included. This detailed continuum shown here was developed by the Systems Approach to Geomorphic Engineering, or the SAGE program, and the Natural and Structural Measures for Shoreline Stabilization brochure that they produced. A number of federal agencies, including the US Army Corps of Engineers, developed and agreed on the SAGE continuum. On the fully gray side on the right, we already have significant expertise on how to design and build hard approaches, but those features would not provide habitat or support coastal processes, so they would not be considered living shorelines. However, there's a middle gray area where hybrid approaches could achieve both criteria and can include placement of natural habitat that works in concert with and protects hard infrastructure and can even lessen the need for it. On the fully green side, the ecosystem grows stronger over time and has the potential to self-recover after events, but we need more research and testing to better predict the coastal protection that's provided from the green techniques. Living shorelines have been gaining attention and press, especially in the context of major climate events such as hurricanes Katrina, Irene, and Sandy. The Breaking the Waves article by Gabriel Popkin in a special issue of Ocean and Climate provides an excellent overview of the needs, designs, and data to date on living shoreline approaches. Interesting graphics are getting generated to help the public and coastal decision makers visualize conceptual designs and habitat components that could be included. Public education is critical if we want to build the public will and funding support to scale up this work. Many private landowners and public partners on the East and Gulf Coast have been leading the way. This has been somewhat driven by the need to protect private shoreline parcels in the face of repeated hurricanes. And many projects have been developed and implemented to replace bulkheads on private property with native vegetation, including mangroves, tidal marshes, and coastal forests. Because there is a smaller tidal exchange of one to three feet in many of those, these East Coast areas versus the bigger range of five to seven feet on the Pacific Coast, the projects are higher in the inner tidal and comprise a relatively small spatial footprint of several hundred linear feet or less. Rock sills are often installed for oyster habitat, as you can see in these pictures on the left, with the goal of supporting wetlands to accrete behind them. Oren Pilkey of Duke University has written concise criticism on the hard materials often used and the lack of monitoring data associated with many of these projects. There has been an increased focus on monitoring over time, especially now that there is 20 billion in funding going to five Gulf states from the BP oil spill. Maryland legislators approved the Living Shorelines Protection Act in 2008, making it state public policy to protect natural habitat and shoreline processes over their 580 acres of shoreline on the Chesapeake Bay and Atlantic coasts. Landowners have to demonstrate that a living shorelines approach is not feasible before being allowed to construct a bulkhead. There are many examples of states that have created regional and state permit mechanisms to make regulatory pathways more efficient for living shorelines projects. Projects such as this example in North Carolina utilize community volunteers in the effort. Here you can see volunteers helping with an oyster shell recycling program using clean half shell saved from local restaurants as building material for the oyster reefs. This shell is then installed in a variety of methods. These projects have provided a model for many pilot projects getting started on the West Coast. The Coastal Conservancy is working to establish a shell recycling program with local restaurants in San Francisco and Tomales Bay to generate shell material for local projects. Hurricane Irene caused some significant damage to back barrier island shorelines in North Carolina. This is a picture of one of Rachel Gitman's bulkhead sites she was sampling pre and post Irene. The top pictures show a bulkhead on the left that completely collapsed and had to be rebuilt, as you can see on the right in the after photo. The living shoreline on the bottom did not suffer any damage. The after picture shows water at high tide, but with rock breakwaters and marsh plantings intact. The only damage was from debris washing onto shore. Gitman's study showed that a majority of bulkheads in areas such as the Outer Banks suffered some level of damage while living shorelines did not. This was only one storm but provides excellent evidence that living shorelines can add habitat value and require lower cost and maintenance. So what is at risk in California? There is a projected 1.4 meters of sea level rise over the next century with the curve expected to accelerate sometime mid-century if we don't curb emissions. 
This would affect almost half a million people living in coastal areas and property valued at more than one billion, including Silicon Valley and other major centers of commerce. As you can see here on the right, there are many risk assessments happening all over the state of varying degrees. This assessment is an important first step in planning for climate change, but very few regions have conducted adaptation planning to define what types of nature-based approaches might be considered, and even fewer have designed and implemented on-the-ground projects. Multiple natural case studies are linking practitioners around the country and highlighting best-of-class examples with nature-based adaptation that's occurring now. These aren't just ideas, but pilot projects projects being implemented in many states, and national information sharing is critical to both find synergies and also recognize variations in design approach due to multiple regional factors. In Southern California, San Francisco Bay, and Humboldt Bay, there have been concerted regional collaborative efforts to quantify the existing status and benefits of shoreline habitats and to develop long-term goals for integrated habitat management and climate adaptation. This work has involved hundreds of collective scientists, agency managers, nonprofits, academics, consultants, and industry working together to develop regional targets and recommendations for potential actions in specific areas. Public agencies are role models and must lead by example. The suite of submerged and intertidal substrate and vegetation types in sheltered estuaries with low wave energy have the potential to provide wave attenuation while also providing spawning and nursery habitats and helping to supply food and resources for many species. All of these habitats occur in different depths, salinity and temperature ranges, and physical conditions. Restoration designs must incorporate siting and methods that take these species and habitat requirements into account. The outer coast is the higher wave energy and deeper environment with more limited options for this approach. However, all the habitat types shown can be considered in living shorelines planning and designs. This is not a one size fits all strategy. Before developing a living shoreline concept anywhere along the elevational gradient, managers need to consider the specific environmental permitting that may, may be required, the specific conditions such as the substrate, wind and wave orientation, and existing infrastructure, and it's also critical to have local support. Since this type of coastal protection is so new in California, many local governments do not want to be the guinea pigs in testing strategies. Getting the community involved early does tend to help to get those local jurisdictions on board. So here's a map of several living shorelines efforts occurring statewide. Evan and Joel will show this graphic again as they discuss the case studies and refer back to the shoreline typology and habitat types that are being incorporated into project designs. The projects in blue will be discussed next, starting with Evan Sloan and the San Francisco Bay Living Shorelines Project. Great, thank you, Marilyn. So as Marilyn mentioned, my name is Evan Sloan and I'm another project manager working at the Coastal Conservancy. Today, I will discuss two living shoreline case studies in California. As Marilyn mentioned, living shoreline projects can include multiple habitat types along this coastal elevation gradient. Today, I will provide examples from the low and the high end of this gradient. However, a living shoreline project that incorporates multiple habitat types along the gradient, or what we like to call a complete shoreline, would be the most ecologically valuable as well as provide the most coastal protection. Starting with the shallow subtitle, the Coastal Conservancy has funded several subtitle living shoreline projects across the state. And today, I will be focusing on one pilot that is the farthest along in terms of implementation and monitoring, which is the San Francisco Bay Living Shoreline Project, one that Marilyn Lada manages here. This project focused on restoring oyster reefs and eelgrass beds to test restoration techniques and the benefits of these habitats on shoreline stabilization. The approach was piloted at two sites in San Francisco Bay, a Nature Conservancy property in the north in San Rafael and the Eden Landing Ecological Reserve in the South Bay in Hayward. This project had multiple objectives, including linking the project's overall objectives with the San Francisco Bay Subtitle Habitat Goals Report. It was also a pilot scale with an experimental approach that built upon the team's past successful trials 
of restoration of eelgrass and native oysters restored separately. It aimed to monitor wildlife used to demonstrate habitat value, as well as assess the interactions of oysters and eelgrass when restored together. The team also evaluated physical benefits, including wave energy reduction and sediment accretion, and they considered how those might contribute to climate change adaptation strategies. Finally, they intend to apply the lessons learned from this pilot project to future projects across the state. Oysters and eelgrass were the ideal habitats to pilot because both habitats are ecosystem engineers that provide multiple physical and e ecological functions and services as is demonstrated, demonstrated in this complex set of conceptual models from the subtitle goals report. The project used an additive design with relatively large plots of oyster settlement substrate, then plots with eelgrass plantings alone, plots with both habitats together, and plots with control with no manipulation. The shell bag mounds were constructed using clean Pacific oyster half shell. The photo on the bottom right is showing the treatment with both the shell bag mound and the eelgrass plantings together. These were aligned along the shore in order to measure shoreline processes at both inshore and offshore of the project. The project was installed in 2012 and the team is entering their fifth year of physical and biological monitoring. Since oyster shell is hard to come by, the project team also wanted to test other possible oyster settlement substrates. To that end, they built several structures using baycrete. Baycrete is a custom concrete mixture that includes native materials such as sand, rock, and shell. Here's an illustration of some of those structures, including the well-known reef balls that were used in this smaller case study. They were also installed in 2012 and have been monitored ever since. For results, in the first year of the project, the project team saw over 2 million oysters present just on the shell mounds. If this number included those bakery structures, that number obviously would be even higher. The biologists also found a great deal of life on the project structures with an overall increase in over 10 taxa. Some of the species included Dungeness crab, nudibranchs, night herons, and red rock crab. In terms of the physical changes, the team found that the shell mounds subsided approximately 10 centimeters, as well as having sediment accrete around and inside the shell mounds. This figure is showing the survey date on the x-axis, meaning the shell mound drawing on the left represents the initial installation, whereas the shell mound drawing on the right represents the subsided structure after three years. This level of subsidence was actually less than the project team had expected. The two solid lines near the ground surface are demonstrating accretion that occurred around the bottom third of the shell mounds. These results really demonstrate the balance of ecosystem services that living shoreline projects grapple with. On one hand, they, the team wanted accretion of sediments to help shorelines keep pace with sea level rise. On the other hand, those sediments are smothering the ecologically valuable oysters. With this information, the team plans to design the next project to optimize oyster habitat only at the top of the shell mound bags, using some other material near the bottom rather than the precious half shell. For wave attenuation, the project team found that most of the energy was lost on the broad mud flat, but that the oyster reef could extract 30% more energy at mean tide levels when the water levels were shallow enough to hit the reef. For the eelgrass habitat, there was actually a drastic loss between 2015 and 2016, which occurred not only in the Living Shoreline Project's plantings, it was also seen in some original test plots that were present for the past nine years. There are several possible explanations for this loss, including an increase in turbidity, wave action, and predation from Canadian geese. But it does demonstrate the ephemeral nature of such eelgrass habitat. That being said, the project team, with the support of the subtitle goals report, acknowledged the great need for eelgrass habitat in San Francisco Bay and decided to replant in May 2016, whose results I'm showing here on this slide. As you can see, by summer, they learned that these oyster reef structures can actually be beneficial to the growth of eelgrass. Although they need to test this further, it looks like the shell mound reefs might provide protection that helps the eelgrass establish. 
The project team is now taking those results and applying lessons learned to a new Living Shoreline project at a tiny marsh called Giant Marsh in Richmond, California. This project will incorporate even more habitat types, such as the low and mid-marsh tidal wetland plants, including the listed and previously extirpated from San Francisco Bay, Sueda Californica. Next, let's move up the elevation gradient to beaches and dunes. The Coastal Conservancy has funded several dune restoration projects, and today I will focus on one that I manage here at the Coastal Conservancy that is aiming to provide physical protection as well as dune habit, habitat in North County, San Diego, called the Cardiff Beach Living Shoreline Project. As Marilyn mentioned, living shorelines are not a one-size-fits-all solution, and the special conditions at each site must be taken into consideration. On the outer coast, living shoreline projects are really in their infancy, as it is difficult to work with high-energy systems. In California, we have a large tidal range of 5 to 10, 7 feet. Our waves can exceed 30 meters at times, and we can also see storm surge from 1 to 2 feet. Further complicating the issue, beach morphology changes during the wet and dry seasons, and periodic El Nino events can occur, making those changes even more dramatic. With all of that, 10% of our coastline is also armored, making living shoreline projects even more difficult to implement. However, California's coast used to have natural protection with habitats like vegetated dunes up and down the coast. In Southern California, those historic dunes have been heavily impacted by coastal transportation development, such as railroads and highways. One of those highways is Highway 101 in the city of Encinitas in North County, San Diego. This stretch of highway along Cardiff State Beach is under great threat from present day flooding and ongoing sea level rise. The highway has been damaged, undermined, and flooded on numerous occasions in the past as a result of extreme wave events and high tides. These issues led the city to consider several alternatives to protect the highway today and in the future where effects will likely be even worse due to sea level rise. So instead of continuing to build this riprap revetment up on an emergency basis or build a seawall to protect the highway, the city decided to consider a more habitat-based approach where the team would turn this present-day beach landscape to this, a vegetated dune system. This is a visual simulation of what the project could look like. The dune habitat would run approximately half a mile along the vulnerable segment of the highway to protect it from present flooding and future sea level rise while also providing much needed dune habitat. In order to make this concept a reality, the team had to consider those site-specific conditions, including, first, there just wasn't a lot of space to work with. The beach itself is not very wide, recently averaging between 150 and 200 feet wide. Secondly, there is critical infrastructure, such as restaurants and the highly trafficked Highway 101. Because of those space and infrastructure constraints, the project team understood that this would have to be a green-gray hybrid approach, utilizing both gray infrastructure along with the dune habitat. So the project team decided to capitalize on the existing beach materials for further protection beyond the vegetated dunes. First, Cardiff Beach is a very cobble-rich beach. Cobbles have been demonstrated in other projects to be extremely useful in preventing erosion as they help further dissipating wave energy. With that, the team decided to use the native cobble material in the living shoreline design. Secondly, there is a relatively small riprap revetment along the Highway 101. In these photos, you can see that revetment, which is spread out in some areas and keyed in in others. We then decided to repurpose this riprap to serve a real function in protecting the highway from undermining underneath the dunes. We also wanted to study how long the dunes could per persist in the future. We did this by modeling sea level rise and storm effects using the X-Beach model. For sea level rise, we used the 0.9 feet increase by 2050 following the current state guidance. Selecting a sea level rise rate was important because the team wasn't able to go beyond 2050 as cities just don't plan that far ahead. Even going to 2050 was a stretch considering the city's typical planning efforts span about 30 years. In this figure, the present day beach profile is represented by that dotted line. The gray line represents the as-built profile for the proposed dune project. 
the blue and yellow lines are demonstrating how two possible dune designs would be affected by sea level rise and a 43 year swell event. As you can see, the dunes do steepen and erode, but are still standing in 2050. Further, the modeling demonstrated that some of the cobble would then be deposited on the foreshore beach face, providing additional protection of the dunes. The red line is demonstrating that the beach would look what the beach would look like if there is no project after the same storm event, and the black line is showing what the beach profile would look like following a sea level rise rate of 0.9 feet with no project and no storms. The final site condition that was considered was the success of past beach nourishment projects at Carter State Beach. Where some beach nourishment projects in the area add sand that is nearly immediately lost to erosion in the following wet season, the two beach nourishment projects that were done at Cardiff in 2001 and 2012 have been deemed successful by researchers at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, where Cardiff Beach was showing consistently wider beaches compared to unnourished beaches with similar wave conditions. With all those site conditions in mind, the team came up with this conceptual design, which is still in draft. This is actually the 30% design that you're seeing here. As you can see, we plan to consolidate the existing rock material and fill in holes where necessary to defend the highway from undermining while the vegetated dunes will be protecting the highway from overtopping. For the cobble, we intend to place the cobble over the rock to serve as a cobble core as is similar to other successful living shoreline projects in the region. However, this figure is a little misleading because the cobble really extends beyond the project and is under the sand throughout the beach, as you can see from this erosion event photo once again. So in thinking about this green-gray design, our project probably fits somewhere in here. Looking beyond 2050, more drastic measures will be needed to protect this stretch of highway. That said, the beauty of this current project is that we are preventing the building of a seawall or a large rock revetment while providing vital dune habitat and also giving the city the time needed to analyze what needs to be done by 2050 and develop those plans. With that, the project team hopes to embark on another feasibility study once the dunes have been constructed to analyze the possibility of lifting the highway onto a causeway or doing some sort of managed retreat. This type of approach will take many years, and in the meantime, the current project will be filling an ecological void. I focused a lot on the physical today, but of course the dunes will also be vegetated with native and rare dune plant species. Here are some photos of our plant palette, which the Santa Alejo Lagoon Conservancy will be planting by hand seeding and planting container plants. We have also developed a robust monitoring program analyzing the seasonal changes in beach and dune morphology using photogrammetry by drone and RTK surveys, which will be carried out by Scripps and UCLA. There will also be extensive dune vegetation monitoring and invasive control as well, again carried out by the Santa Elena Lagoon Conservancy. This monitoring program will demonstrate the efficacy of such designs for flood protection up and down the coast, as well as quantify the habitat evolution. To date, the project has been fully funded for implementation and monitoring. We are currently in the final design and permitting phase, and the project is planned to be constructed in early 2018. Thank you. Okay, so I'm uh, Joel Gerwan, uh, also a project manager here at the Coastal Conservancy, and I'll be talking about some living shorelines projects we're involved in that focus on tidal wetland habitats. Here's a map showing some of those types of projects that we've funded across the state. These are all at different stages from planning to implementation, and I'll be talking about two projects in Humboldt Bay, starting with the Arcata Bay Adaptation Ventures project. So uh, this is the project site uh, right next to the city of Arcata in North uh, Humboldt Bay. Um, and uh, the purpose of the project is to protect the Arcata wastewater treatment plant. Uh, you can see that the original concept was to create a 22 acre band of living shoreline uh, adjacent to the existing rock revetment around the wastewater treatment plant. Um, as 
Marilyn mentioned, uh, it's important to look at local conditions when developing these projects. And uh, one of the really key conditions at this particular site is the wind and the wave fetch. There's a really long uh, fetch at this site and a strong south wind in this part of the bay. And uh, so it was really important to keep that in mind that you'd be dealing with a lot of wave energy and eros erosion potential at this site. You can see the rock, uh, rock levees at the bottom that were designed to deal with this. Um, another thing to uh, keep in mind with this project is that uh, there's no existing <clears throat> tidal marsh at this location at the moment, or only a very small amount. So the map you're seeing here shows uh, benthic habitats in North Humboldt Bay. And just focus on the yellow and the uh, light orange. The yellow indicates coastal marshes, and the light orange indicates mud flats. You can see the project site uh, up there circled in red. And notice there are coastal marshes adjacent to this site. Uh, those are actually marshes that have accreted in the last half century or so, but no marshes at the site location itself. And even historic mapping going back to the 1800s didn't show any marshes at this location. So that's kind of a uh, cautionary note in developing this project about whether uh, it will be possible to sustain coastal marshes in a living shoreline at this site. However, there is a narrow band of fringe marsh that's developed at the edge of the rock levee along the wastewater treatment plant. So that indicates that there may be a way to create marsh here. Here's a map uh, showing um, vulnerability of the project site. This is an inundation map um, showing a half a meter of uh, sea level rise, <coughs> excuse me, plus the mean maximum monthly uh, high water. And you can see the blue areas are inundated here. So that includes the uh, oxidation ponds, uh, most of the wastewater treatment pond. The oxidation ponds, I'm highlighting the cursor here, as well as what's called Clop Lake. Um, the wastewater treatment plant also serves as a nature sanctuary. Um, and uh, you can see um, that the actual wastewater treatment plant itself um, is not fully inundated, but these ponds are with this amount of sea level rise. Um, as the city began the design process, uh, they turned to uh, considering community priorities as well as technical design considerations. These are some priorities that the public have shared in uh, sea level rise related outreach for Humboldt Bay Regional Sea Level Rise Planning. Um, the city also convened a technical advisory committee which reviewed uh, designs based on a list of social, economic, and environmental criteria that you can see here. And then all of those considerations were balanced against the core components of a living shoreline project, the desire to attenuate wave energy, to accrete sediment, to keep up with sea level rise, and to provide uh, habitat. So uh, in, in developing the actual designs for the project, the city turned to Humboldt State University students. And uh, they divided the project area into these six sub areas, each of which differed in microsite conditions. Some of these areas uh, like site two have more exposure to strong wave energy. Others uh, have a wastewater outfall, for example, or um, are at the mouth of a slough. So all of those types of conditions were taken into account by the student teams in working on these designs. The city asked the students to incorporate natural materials into their designs, such as oyster reef, coir logs, and large woody debris. And here's some of the conceptual designs that the students developed, ranging from the high-low marsh alternative, gently uh, a sloping um, marsh uh, that you see in the upper right to the burrito step tide pools, which uh, used some harder structures to encourage uh, sediment deposition in between them there. Students uh, modeled the fill that would be required for these projects, the potential marshland that would be created, and the percent wave attenuation, as well as estimating cost. Uh, the city reviewed these proposed designs and selected four pilot designs that they would like to bring forward to implementation at a pilot level at four sites, as well as additional sites where large woody debris would be 
uh, deployed, which you can see in these dots here in the upper right. And let's take a closer look at a couple of these projects. Uh, so this, this one, uh, you can see the existing levy here on the left. And then you have these two areas with these harder structures uh, kind of anchoring them. Um, about 30 feet wide and at the bay edge next to the existing mud flat, there's oyster shell bags and a coir log. And then uh, 15 feet in, you can see there's a peeler log and willow wattles to provide structure there. Um, there are some salt tolerant willows that have been used in these types of uh, uh, shoreline habitats in Humboldt Bay restoration projects in the past. So that's what allows them to use willow in this location. And the hope is that uh, these structures would encourage sediment accretion to happen in the areas in between them. Here you can see that same uh, design in plant view. You can also see the large woody debris against the levee along the fringe marsh here. And again, you get the sense that these are very small uh, pilot projects, 30 feet wide, and each module being 100 feet in length. And we'll hear later that that can be helpful in terms of some of the regulatory and permitting considerations for living shorelines. Uh, here's a similar uh, design, slightly different. Um, here you can see, again, the, the levee on the left, and the hard structures in this case are just a uh, coir log in the middle, and then the oyster shell bags down by the mud flat as well. In this case, the design involves placement of some uh, sediment to start the accretion process happening. And we see the same uh, uh, design and plan view here. Again, a uh, small uh, footprint for these designs. So these, this, this is currently this uh, project is currently in the permitting stage and uh, still finalizing those pilot designs and talking with regulatory agencies to get their input on them. I want to just step back a little bit uh, with this photo and uh, just say that the city has been really progressive and forward thinking in terms of pursuing uh, marsh restoration and more of a kind of managed retreat maintenance of open space where it can on the um, east and west sides of the built up core of the city, as you can see in these black air, uh, outlined areas where significant marsh restoration has happened. But at this project site, uh, there's a really valuable piece of uh, critical infrastructure, the wastewater treatment plant, and all of the wastewater system is plumbed down to that location. So the city has decided that it wants to protect this in place for as long as it can, but has chosen to use a living shorelines approach to uh, try to provide habitat while it's doing that. So now let me move on to talk about another project in uh, Humboldt Bay that's focused more simply on tidal marsh. That last project, as you saw, incorporated some other uh, habitat types as well that, that was influenced by the uh, San Francisco Bay Living Shorelines project, the lessons from that project. This project is the White Slough Restoration. It's located in uh, the Humboldt Bay National Wildlife Refuge, Refuge in the south part of Humboldt Bay. And the, the project area is a subsided 40 acre brash, brackish marsh behind failing dikes. Uh, because it's subsided, when those dikes fail, uh, it was clear that the project area would convert to mudflat. Well, while mudflat's a valuable habitat type, it hasn't been impacted historically in the same way as tidal marsh has, where there's been a 90% loss of that tidal marsh habitat. And you can see in this picture here that those dikes were severely eroded and were overtopping at higher tides. So here again is the project location. You can see that this project area in blue here is right adjacent to Highway 101. This is the College of the Redwoods um, here. So there's also an access road at the interchange here that leads to the College of the Redwoods adjacent to the project area. Uh, here's a closer up view that shows that same uh, Highway 101 and the access road. Here's an inundation map showing the vulnerability of the project. This is the mean maximum monthly uh, high water and a 100 year event, a still water level from that 100 year event. And, and you can see actually that uh, the inundation map here doesn't show Highway 101 inundated in this location, although the access road is just about inundated. And Highway 101 is actually much more vulnerable south of the project. 
So this project was really developed with a focus on tidal marsh restoration rather than on sea level rise adaptation. Um, the uh, refuge had experienced uh, a similar case of conversion to mudflat loss of tidal marshes here at Teal Island uh, to the southwest of this project and wanted to prevent that from happening here. And while they were designing this project, they also wanted to look at the opportunity to protect the highway and access road um, at the same time. So here's a shot of the project area before implementation, uh, fairly monocultural uh, brackish marsh vegetation that was uh, present at the site. You can see the highway is a, uh, a causeway in part of this location. While we were developing the project and after we'd secured gotten pretty far into design, the dikes actually did breach at the southern uh, tide gate location. And uh, we almost gave up on the project because it would have been very logistically difficult to carry it out after the project site was inundated, but we're able to plug the hole in the dike with a water bladder dam that you can see being placed here. Uh, here's another shot after that breach. You can see that the area was inundated and you get a sense of what, how this area would have converted to mud flat and how the water would be right up against the Highway 101 embankment at this location. So some cause for concern for the integrity of that embankment over time. Um, this is the existing topography uh, pre-project and the lower elevations are shown in red and orange and yellow. So you can see that most of the project area had subsided to about three feet in elevation uh, or lower than that. This is the highway here in purple and pink at the higher elevation. And the idea of the project was to bring this area up to tidal marsh elevations to raise it by about three or more feet um, and then breach the dikes. And that would be done by bringing in about 250,000 cubic yards of sediment. So you can see here that the target elevations were in these light blue to darker blue colors, more like uh, seven to nine feet in elevation. Um, and that design was made uh, kind of at the higher end of marsh elevations in order to make the project last longer uh, in terms of keeping up with sea level rise. So the, the uh, lowest elevation where you can support tidal marsh vegetation at the moment is around 5.8 feet. Um, but the target elevations are higher than that, more like seven feet for most of the project area so that the projected sea level rise of a foot or more um, in this location won't drown that marsh as quickly as it would otherwise. So here, here's just a shot of the project actions. One notable feat you can see here is that these tidal ridges were developed um, first, the first phase of project. And these are going to support tidal marsh uh, vegetation. They're at an appropriate elevation for that. But they also have a logistical purpose of providing access for construction and sediment and also dividing the area into basins so that we can fill those basins one at a time as sediment becomes available. You'll also note that in the back here, this uh, area along the highway is separated out into another basin. Originally, we were going to just meet the embankment uh, with the fill, but uh, it was difficult to work with Caltrans engineering specs and regulations. And in the end, for the sake of expediency and moving forward, we just separated the project from the Caltrans embankment in that part of the project area. Uh, here's the post-project habitat types. You'll see that some of those tidal ridges remain as high marsh, and in other places they are pulled out uh, when we no longer need them for construction access, and most of the project area will be salt marsh after implementation. The project is in the midst of implementation now. Uh, you can see the before picture. These are from 2015 on the left. And then on the right side, um, you can see the tidal ridges have been completed. This is about 70,000 cubic yards of sediment that were brought in to do this. And there should be another 70,000 or so brought in this uh, summer to start bringing those basins up to tidal marsh elevations. Uh, in terms of lessons learned so far from this project, uh, one is the difficulty of working with Caltrans engineering specs, even though we're trying to provide protection for Highway 101 in this location. It's also been quite difficult to find uh, sediment for beneficial reuse for the project and to permit the use of that sediment for in terms of sampling and testing those sediment sources has been rather time consuming and can also be expensive. 
Uh, a final question to think about with this project is whether this is uh, really a living shorelines project or is it just another tidal marsh restoration project? As I mentioned, the primary reason for pursuing this project was to restore tidal marsh at this location and not have it converted to mudflat, but it does also provide wave attenuation to protect the highway embankment and access road and increase the sediment accretion, benefits of living shorelines. So it's an interesting question to keep in mind when looking at these types of projects. We've done a lot of tidal marsh restoration projects and they do have these living shorelines features to them in many cases. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Marilyn Latta, who's going to conclude the webinar with some discussions of regulatory and permitting considerations and final thoughts. Great. So some, some great news is that the Army Corps has recently confirmed a new nationwide permit 54 for living shorelines. Um, and this can really help to provide efficiency to the permitting process. Um, it is important to note that the permit is specific to estuaries and low wave energy environments um, and not the outer coast. And it's also limited to relatively small scale projects that are a maximum of 500 linear feet and with treatments that are within 30 feet channel word of mean low tide line. So Joel mentioned that the small pilot project in Humboldt Bay fits within those metrics. Um, but for many projects and approaches on the larger Pacific Coast tidal range, um, these metrics aren't compatible. And so the core, San Francisco core district at least has allowed for a waiver process for projects that are larger in size. You can apply to have those um, limits waived. And also the State Water Resources Control Board has pre-certified their Section 401 water quality certifications that relate to this nationwide permit and has exempted these projects from CEQA review since their activities should not have a significant effect on the environment. So this is a great step forward in our region, although more work needs to be done at the state and regional level to clarify definitions and criteria for West Coast Living Shorelines approaches. Um, there are also advances in policy support at the state level, including Executive Order B3015, which requires that state agencies prioritize natural infrastructure solutions, and Senate Bill 246, which recommends nature-based approaches as part of an integrated climate adaptation and resiliency program. There are also many state agencies and plans that further support research into this work, including the Safeguarding California Plan, and the fourth climate assessment that is now underway, led by the Nature Conservancy and other partners to refine the definitions and design guidance for coastal natural infrastructure. The California Coastal Commission has updated its sea level rise policies and can pro provide funding for sea level rise updates and nature-based planning to local coastal plans. Um, the Coastal Conservancy has also included climate change and sea level rise considerations in our project selection criteria and the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission is one example of many agencies that are currently reviewing their policies around sea level rise and around the use of beneficial fill for these types of projects. So as we've been talking about, thoughtful shoreline innovation and nature-based adaptation can provide solutions, but we're in an early state of science with designing and constructing effective approaches. We need to leverage the huge amount of work that has been done on thoughtful regional landscape planning and match it with thoughtful experimentation of pilot on the ground projects. These pilot projects and high quality monitoring of actions are critical to developing strong best management practices and design criteria that are effective and achievable. We need to continue to work with our agencies and improve regulations to allow for placement of beneficial fill and also to support experimental projects as we learn what works. And this can require some trial and error, which is hard to fit within the regulatory regime. So we need increased capacity on all fronts, people who can design, permit, construct, and monitor soft shoreline approaches. And as Evan and Joel described, there are many site-specific considerations when planning a project. It's really important to carefully consider existing shoreline uses and especially the parcel ownership. Many people aren't aware that there can be a complex patchwork of public and private ownership as shown here in the San Francisco Bay map snapshot on the bottom right. The parcels in red are privately owned and it can take substantial time just to identify the landowners and then make sure that you 
target sites for these approaches that have willing landowners who want to participate. It's also critical to have good bathymetry data and to assess if you have appropriate depths for habitat restoration at a location that can have an effect on the wave climate, and also appropriate depths for access by barges, construction equipment, and people. It's critical to avoid impacts to existing habitats and species and include the most current sea level rise modeling for your area. And last, we really can't highlight enough that physical space is required for this approach, and some sites are much more constrained than others. There's also a complex regulatory framework to navigate, especially at this terrestrial aquatic interface. Strong environmental laws require detailed analysis of proposed, of proposed project impacts and benefits, such as the Federal Endangered Species Act and regional jurisdictions that limit placement of fill. These are important considerations and environmental policy that should be protected, but there are also areas for improved coordination and decision making, even in the face of data gaps. So it's important to think carefully about field justification, suitable materials, uh, the particular construction methods and timing, and with all of this, have a focus on avoidance and minimization of species impacts. There can be incredible complexity associated with sequential permits from different agencies, which can involve long time frames and a high cost. But we have a strong history of environmental protection to build upon, and these rec regulations need to be updated and improved rather than thrown out wholesale. So we are threading the needle between innovation and feasibility at this stage with Living Shorelines in California. There are barriers to innovation, including science and data gaps, institutional inertia, lack of a broader context for shoreline planning and management, and lack of an advocate for new innovation. It's critical to keep a strong focus on feasibility, as this New York Times image demonstrates on the bottom right. It shows a provocative image of wetlands placed around Manhattan after Hurricane Sandy, but technical designs would include very different placement and types of treatments. We need to protect habitat and species through pilot projects that are carefully tested and document success before scaling up, and then continue to monitor the long-term benefits and impacts. With all of these options that are out there, but very few of them tested on the West Coast, California needs, is doing, and also needs to do more demonstration projects. These demonstration projects really require robust monitoring programs to demonstrate the efficacy of these natural habitats to protect our shorelines, as well as the habitat potential for hybrid green gray infrastructure. Uh, we've been talking a lot about how climate adaptation and habitat resilience depends on new innovation with our shoreline management that is thoughtful and innovative, but also science-based, sustainable, permittable, and cost-effective. So we have one last polling question for the group before we transition to our question and answer session. Uh, so we wanted to ask everyone, what do you think would be the biggest obstacle to a Living Shorelines project in your area? So we'll leave a few seconds for time to submit your answer to that. And then we'll go ahead and close the poll. And we can see the answers to that. Ah, looks like a pretty good mix of the regulatory considerations, funding, especially for new approaches that haven't been tested, um, lack of expertise, and then availability of other logistical challenges. Great. Well, we really want to thank everybody for uh, listening to the presentation and the case studies that we've provided, and we'd like to open it up for questions, although we're depending on the chat box questions. So we'll read those out and then answer those as much as we have time for. Yeah, so we have quite a few questions already. So the first one is a request for Marilyn. Can you mention the citation on criticisms of rock material again? Uh, that is a paper by Oren Pilkey. It's P-I-L-K-E-Y. I believe he's with Duke University. And it's a white paper that just, you know, really does kind of criticize that um, a few of the first early generation projects on the East Coast focused much too heavily on the rock, you know, with the goal of oyster restoration, but really it's still a lot of hard infrastructure with a little bit of gardening thrown in. 
Um, so he's got a pretty concise criticism in this white paper and some suggestions for how to increase the green side of living shorelines approaches and also the monitoring of the environmental benefits of these approaches. And we'd be happy to include that white paper when we send out the notes for the webinar. Great. So the second question was about the San Francisco go uh, living shorelines project how well did the oyster beds survive the heavy sediment and fresh water flow this winter that is a great question that we are uh, anticipating and the answer to so uh, throughout this project we've been aware that during extreme rain years which is great to get out of our drought um, a long sustained periods of fresh water can negatively impact Olympia oysters so I think you know anything more than 10 or 14 days at lower than five parts per thousand salinity um, can have a negative effect. So far, we have not seen that effect, but our major monitoring will occur in April, May, low tide series, where we're really gonna see the effect from these winter storms. Okay. The question um, about the Carded project, was the storm scenario used for planning a 43 year flood event? Great, yeah, so we actually modeled four different wave events. We did a 43-year seas event, a 43-year swell event, a 100-year swell event, and a 100-year seas event. Um, the figure I showed was for the 43-year swell event with sea level rise. And um, I showed one of the more eroded scenarios um, for the for most of them they were pretty similar in erosion although the hundred year events had a lot more overtopping um, so that was what we they modeled upon okay um, so another request for Marilyn can you send the citation for the article that you mentioned I think you said it was called breaking waves in a journal called oceans and climate yes we could definitely send that out <laughs> okay great um, uh, what was the extent of sediment testing in the Humboldt Bay project? Yeah, so uh, for for White Slough project, um, the water board asked for uh, a uh, kind of statistically valid approach to sediment testing so they could compare um, the sediment properties across the different um, sites that we're proposing to bring sediment from uh, and compare those to the sediment properties at White Slough. So both at the White Slough site where we're restoring and at the various donor sites, uh, they, we needed to do um, three sets of 30 samples each um, that were randomly located and then test those for kind of a broad array of uh, potential contaminants. And the general approach has been that if the donor sites are uh, less contaminated or equally contaminated to White Slough, um, then it's okay to bring those sediments in. And just experience, you know, it, it takes time to develop the sampling plan to get it approved. And then if you have a high hit for something in, in one spot that might be anomalous, you still might need to do some additional testing, like a bioassay, for example, that can take quite a while. So you just have to build in a lot of time for that. And uh, it can be an expense as well, especially if a donor site doesn't work out in the end, but you've already gone to the expense of testing the materials there. Uh, next question, will there be any follow-up webinars on monitoring data? I love the idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think on implementation? Public support, funding, regulatory, or what else? <laughs> that is, those are all factors I think that we're all grappling with as we plan and implement these projects. Um, you know, I have to say I've been really pleased at the public support. Um, I think once you put an effort in sharing these project designs and the value of natural infrastructure, you really can get communities on board and advocating with their own elected officials and funding agencies. Um, you know, I have great respect for our regulatory um, protocols, but I have to say I do think that the limits on the placement of fill or the um, concerns that agencies have with data gaps and not having evidence that these 
you know, projects will work before they're allowed to permit them or before they will issue a permit. I think that is a major challenge. And I applaud the entities such as you know, the ones we've mentioned in San Francisco Bay, including BCDC, that have stepped forward and allowed the pilot projects to move forward, and hopefully that can continue to increase. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I think that um, these pilot projects will really help, you know, demonstrate the effectiveness to the landowners and the uh, responsible entities. I've seen in past projects that, it, as Marilyn mentioned, it's really hard to be the guinea pig. And so local governments and landowners have really struggled with being responsible if a project fails or if they need if there's going to be any ongoing maintenance of the project. So as soon as we get our monitoring results and can share those, I think that will really help our process in California. And then I'll just add to uh, back on the sediment issue. I think if, if once we if we get past the pilot stage and are looking at implementing these types of projects on a larger scale, we're going to start hitting a, a scarcity of sediment. And you know, we're at the moment we're taking a lot of material out of our literal cell. And uh, there's definitely an effort to rethink that and try to encourage beneficial reuse. But we've still got quite a ways to go in making that happen. So I think that's also a real important thing to keep working on to make these types of projects a reality. Okay. Um, please address lack of political will and how to overcome it. Well, that is a big one. Maybe I'll just uh, address an example of a, um, a recent um, bond measure or, or partial tax measure that passed. So it just shows that it is possible. We recently had nine county park tax approved years each year over the next 20 years that would generate about $500 million in support, funding support for wetlands restoration by Save the Bay and, and other partners um, to really raise public awareness in terms of the value of important, you know, clean water and healthy habitat and also the function that natural infrastructure can play. Um, so I, you know, I think it requires a lot of targeted face-to-face -to -face meetings and phone calls and really sharing information about the value of these habitats. Um, but then we can see people vote and fund projects such as this. Um, was data regarding non-native wildlife use of the SF installed oyster bed collected? Question from everyone. That is a great question, and I really also want to highlight the partners. UC Davis has led all of the monitoring of the oyster reefs, design and monitoring, and they um, conduct pretty extensive surveys of all the life on the reef, as well as control plots on the shoreline so that we compare against natural conditions. We do have um, non-native species that are present on the reefs, but they are not in any way um, the majority. In fact, we're, we're seeing no difference in terms of the level of non-native species on the shoreline versus on the project. And that's something that we carefully want to um, watch because we certainly don't want reefs only covered in non-native species. Okay, kind of a long question coming up. I think more emphasis on difference between erosion control and flood protection need to be made. In the Bay Area, we are plagued by urban development right up to the Bay shoreline protected by levees. There's little room to build inland for living shorelines, which means building out into the bay, which, as you can imagine, come with heavy regulatory issues. Have any projects been conducted with living shorelines and FEMA? Flood protection generally requires FEMA approval, which I haven't seen any FEMA approved living shorelines. So I might jump in here again. I think it's important to note that the pilot projects at this stage are testing concepts and are not actually designed to achieve flood control until we learn more about what works and can scale up. Um, so to my knowledge, there haven't been project trigger FEMA permitting or FEMA coordination um, because they're in this pilot phase. Um, I do really appreciate the point that was made that many of these sites are very constrained, experiencing coastal squeeze, and there's just no room to keep going inland. Um, so there are, you know, site by site 
considerations for proposing beneficial fill, um, which does bring up a habitat conversion issue. You know, we need to look very carefully at the full region and then the specific site and segment in terms of uh, whether it is appropriate to replace, you know, potentially small amounts of mudflat or subtle fill horizontal level, you know, creating tidal marsh habitat. Um, so that's, I certainly agree, that is a balancing act and requires strong justification and consideration of those habitats in a design approach. Okay. Where does the funding come from for these pilot projects? Uh, well, uh, I could speak to that. Um, yeah, the Conservancy has certainly been happy to be able to provide some funding uh, out of our various bond measure funding, uh, and then also uh, from the Coastal Resiliency account when there was funding in that account. Um, we've also been fortunate to work with uh, federal funders such as the Fish and Wildlife Service with their National Coastal Wetlands. Um, program and I believe uh, the EPA has also provided. I don't know. Let's, my yeah. fellow project managers can speak to some of the other sources of funding. Yeah, the EPA actually provided um, through the San Francisco Water Quality Improvement Program um, and San Francisco Estuary Partnership provided the first seed grant. And I always call out a big thank you to EPA because you know it's hard to be the first funder, and then it's, it helps you to leverage and go for additional funding. Um, we've also been able to get funding through the Wildlife Conservation Board, through NOAA Fisheries, and I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, but yeah. Yeah, Evan, do you want to add? Yeah, and the, for the Cardiff project, that was funded by the Coast Art Agency, um, as well as the Ocean Protection Council and um, the Coastal Commission. And then for another project we didn't talk about, the Seal Beach project, which I consider a living shoreline project as well, that did thin layer sediment addition to a tidal wetland. We got funding from our agency, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and their um, carbon sequestration grant program to try to test that those effects, as well as the US Fish and Wildlife. So again, I think it's worth noting that some of that federal funding, particularly EPA and NOAA, um, but potentially some of the fish and wildlife sources as well could be threatened in the current political climate. So that's something, if we recognize the value of these types of projects, that it's good to advocate for continued funding of those types of things. And one more question um, about Cardiff. If you raise the road with a cogway, how do you propose raising the adjacent private property? So the segment of highway that's vulnerable along um, Cardiff Beach is lower in elevation than the rest of the highway. And that vulnerable stretch uh, is um, in between Cardiff State Beach and the San Alejo Lagoon. So there isn't um, homes or anything like that adjacent to it. It's the lagoon system. And actually, the highway and the roadway constrain the mouth of the lagoon. And um, it, the concept would be, although this is controversial, uh, that if you raised it, you could have a more natural system for the beach movement as well as the lagoon mouth. And there's also been a lot of questions about getting PDFs of the slides. Um, there will be a PDF of the slide and a recording sent out to all attendees afterwards. Great. Great. Thanks so much, Jen, for joining us. Touch. Our emails are up on the screen. We're happy to provide more info and continue this conversation with everyone on Living Shorelines in California.